Well, greetings, brethren, and happy Sabbath to all of you. As we are fast approaching uh, the Feast of Pentecost, think about some of these themes, the Israelites coming out of Egypt on their journey to Sinai and following that cloud, looking to God and learning and growing and uh, developing faith, or not in some of the case of many at that time. Uh, but uh, that is what is supposed to be happening uh, among the people of God then and now. What thoughts leap to your mind when you hear the word faith? Miraculous healing? Walking on water? Daniel unharmed in the lion's den? All of these, uh, of course, are the outcome the results of faith. But they do not constitute faith itself. And while there certainly is an association here, faith, as we will shortly see, involves so much more. Do you sometimes go through your day trying to keep focused on living a Christian life, only dipping into faith, however, when you need some noticeably miraculous divine intervention. Though I think we'd all agree that that's not how we should think. That's sometimes the way that it turns out. Indeed, our struggle to walk in God's way can actually become a futile legalistic exercise if we don't have a proper understanding of the need for faith. I want you to turn over to Matthew 23. Matthew 23, and of course this is where Jesus was rebuking the scribes and Pharisees. And he really cut right to the heart of the issue here in uh, Matthew 23 and verse 23. When he said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, that is people who live behind a mask, like the actors in a play at that time. For you pay tithes of mint and anise and cumin, these tithing these little tiny seeds, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These ought you to have done without leaving the others undone. So we have here the fact that while every part of God's law is important. Some parts, namely as we see here, justice, mercy, and faith, and Luke 11 also adds the love of God. These are even more important. These are the weightier matters of the law. And Christ rebuked these scribes and Pharisees for their hypocrisy in going after these smallest ordinances and yet neglecting the most important areas of God's way of life. (coughs) (coughs) So brethren, today, let's consider the weightier matter of faith. The weightier matter of faith. That is the title. First I want to talk about the law of faith. And I'd like you to turn over to Hebrews 11 to start. Hebrews 11. Just what exactly is faith, anyway? Most of us are familiar with the definition here in Hebrews 11. Uh, We'll look at verse 1. Hebrews 11 is known as the faith chapter. It introduces us to many great people of of faith in the Bible. Uh, But verse 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But what does that really mean? Technically speaking, the word faith is a translation of the Greek pistis, which is the noun form of the verb pisteo, which means to believe. In simpler terms, the word for faith could just as well well have been translated belief, as it is in other places. By the same token, some have actually coined the verb to (laughs) faith, like as a verb, uh, like to replace occurrences of believe, because these are often interchangeable terms. I like to translate more because I don't think it's just belief in the sense that, well, you you accept that that's the case or you think that, 
Uh, but it's to trust. There's a trust here. It's more than believing about something. It's believing in something to the point of trust. And, it, and in this case, we're talking about God, obviously. So it's a matter of trust. Trust being both a uh, noun and a verb. The word substance here in Hebrews 11.1, 1, again, faith is the substance of things hopes, hoped for, is translated from the Greek word, get ready for it, hypostasis. What is that? Yes, but that is the same word that has been misused by mainstream Christianity with respect to the Trinity argument. One God in three persons, and they'll even say one God in three hypostases, which they say means the ground of being uh, in, a, in a sense of a, of a person. But really, that is a misuse. What we're talking about here is a compound word, hypostasis, is formed from hypo, meaning under, and st- histemi, meaning to stand up or to establish. So what we're talking about is something that stands under, something that forms a foundation or a base. In fact, uh, hold your place. Well, actually, we'll, we will come back to here in a few minutes, but if you look at Hebrews 3, I'll just note to you here, in Hebrews 3, 14, it says, For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence... And that word is hypostasis, steadfast to the end. So here it's translated confidence, which is an interesting word. That's an English word, confidence. But again, con fide is where that comes from. With faith is the idea. Um, so that, that uh, gives you this sense of something that you trust in. You have a, a deep uh, belief in. Now, back in Hebrews 11, where you just were, uh, again, it says it's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That word evidence can be translated proof. It's the proof. So, in essence, then, it is our faith or belief or trust that is the basis of a hoped-for circumstance actually coming to pass. And this faith is all the proof we need in order to know that it certainly will. So it's the basis of these hoped for things. I'd like you to look at Matthew 21. Matthew 21. And again, we will come back to Hebrews 11 here, so keep your place. But in Matthew 21... We have a statement from uh, Jesus about exercising faith. And uh, we'll read in Matthew 21, verses 21 through 22. So Jesus answered and said to them, his disciples here, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, because it withered, at his command, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. I want to focus on the words in prayer. Whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, trusting, you will receive. So true faith in context is not about concentrating really hard and exerting some kind of personal mind power to set events in motion. And sometimes people think, well, i got to have faith, and so I've got to get real focused, and I've got to you know, just trust, I believe it, I believe it, I believe it. Or even I believe God, I believe God. It's, it's not like that. It says you, you're believing, but you're believing based on your praying to God and looking to Him to answer your prayers. That is the mindset that we have to have when approaching our Heavenly Father with a request for Him to fulfill. Now understand, of course, that genuine faith, part of that is realizing that we must ask according to God's will. Because, again, you might think, well, I just ask God and I believe He'll do what I say, uh, and, and, and that's, that's enough. But you have to put it all together. There's a lot more context in that. So we have to know that we 
if we're going to trust in God, we also have to trust that God knows best. <laughs> and so God isn't going to always answer the way we want him to. He may override our requests for our own good or for the good of others. And uh, I'll just give you a couple of references. 1 John 5, 14. 1 John 5, 14, which is where John says that if we ask according to his will, he hears us. So we have to, it has to be in line with, with what God wants, and certainly in an overall sense, but sometimes, even in an in a immediate circumstance, God wants something to work out a little bit differently for the best. And so we always say, as Jesus did, remember, when he prayed, you know, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. In other words, God, you know, would, ha would have things at hand. It would be up to him. And, of course, we have another reference I'll give you. is 2 Corinthians 12. 7 through 10, 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. That's where Paul had this thorn in the flesh. And he says, I prayed three times for God to take it away, but he, he wouldn't, you know. And he said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. My, my strength is, you know, made perfect in weakness. That, that there was a lesson to be learned. And it was better that Paul have this problem because if he didn't have that problem, he might've been too exalted in his own mind and too proud. And God kept him from that danger uh, by the problem that he was, you know, made to continue with. But realizing and recognizing that is a big aspect of faith and trust in God. We have to know God, God has it all in hand. But again, we, have, we must have this mindset of faith whenever we approach God. Turn back to Hebrews 11, the faith chapter again. Whenever we approach God, you know, we're told in Hebrews 11, 6, without faith... It is impossible to please him. You, you cannot please God unless you have this deep trust, this faith in him. For he who comes to God, now we're going to get more specific on this. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Again, this is Hebrews eleven six. I don't know if I specify, but he is a rewarder of those who seek him. So first of all, we must believe he is. That means we must believe in the creator and ruler of the universe. But more than that, the one who is revealed in the pages of the Holy Bible. So it's not some general idea of a God, of a supreme being, of a maker. It's not just that. It's that you have to believe in that he is. Who is he? He is the one revealed in the pages of your Bible. That God, you have to believe in him. That's number one. You have to believe that he exists and that he is, that what he says is true. And, as it says, that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So we must trust that he cares for us and that he wants to richly reward us for wholeheartedly seeking him. You know, some people think, well, we, we just need to follow God without any thought of, of uh, what that means for us. Well, that's not true. The whole point is, is that we are engaged in a relationship with God. And he wants us to be part of his family. Uh, we want him to be our God and to lead us and to bless us. And that's totally good and fine. In fact, that is what you have to have in your mind when you come to God. As it says, you have to believe that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's part of the whole uh, plan of God and, and his purpose for us. And we have to trust that in coming to him. Now, that of course requires that we believe in his power to accomplish anything that he wants to. And why shouldn't we? After all, he made the entire universe. Realizing God was all-powerful, Abraham, and I'd like you to turn over to Romans 4, go into this here. Abraham, who had no legitimate heir, believed that despite his old age, the Almighty would fulfill his promise to give him a vast multitude of descendants through his elderly wife, Sarah. The Apostle Paul explains that Abraham 
And I'm going to, let's look at Romans 4 and verse 20. It says, He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. And again, these are, these are opposites. Unbelief, w- w- being without uh, pistis, that is, or strengthened in pistis, this word for, for faith, for trust. Giving glory to God. Now, the next verse follows with a well-put definition of faith. Verse 21. It says, And being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. He was fully convinced that what God has promised, he was also able to perform. He trusted in that. That's faith right there. That's the faith that we need to have. And then Paul makes an interesting statement. It's very interesting. He says in verse 22, And therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. It says in, he's quoting from uh, Genesis there. But what's the key is, is as Paul says, because of this, because of this belief and trust that he had, therefore, because of that, due to that fact, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, for righteousness, what do we mean by that? Well, righteousness, as well as justification, both have to do with being lined up with God and his way of life. You know, being justified, if you think about like in typing on a computer, you, you justify your, your uh, type, meaning you have it in a perfect alignment along the edge. Uh, but that's what it means as far as our life being lined up with God. Uh, righteousness is the same sense uh, in, in, the, in the idea of being in perfect alignment with God and his way of life. And that follows because, I'll just give you this reference, Psalm 119 Verse 172 says, all your commandments are righteousness. Psalm 119, 172, all your commandments are righteousness. So righteousness is defined by the law of God, being lined up with God, being lined up with his way. And that makes sense as far as alignment with God, but then we ask the question, How is belief imputed as obedience? Because that's what we're talking about here. Because alignment with God, keeping God's laws, that is obedience. But remember it says that his belief, therefore, his belief, his trust, was accounted to him for righteousness, which is obedience. Does that make sense? I mean, maybe not immediately. We have to think about this. There's there's a lot going on here. That this belief somehow is accounted as obedience to God. Every last one of us, brethren, is guilty of breaking God's law. The penalty for which, ultimately, is death. And, you know, Romans 3.23, all have sinned, fall short of the glory of God. And Romans 6.23 the penalty, of the wages of sin is death. I mean, that clearly means that we've all been out of alignment with God. Nevertheless, through God's amazing mercy, we can be justified, put back in line with Him by repenting and accepting in faith that Christ's sacrifice has paid the penalty for sin in our place. And we're told that numerous times, you know, about by faith, being justified. That's in here too. Paul repeatedly mentions that. Now bear in mind that true repentance is a deep commitment to obey God from this point forward. So when you repent, you're agreeing to obedience. And although initial justification occurs apart from actual physical deeds, and I want us to see that, look at Uh, Romans 3 here, verse 28, it says very specifically, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. That's true, because there is an accounting of righteousness, an accounting, an imputation of obedience 
when you repent and agree to obey. That's when you are imputed righteous. You are accounted righteous through your trust and commitment at the time of repentance. But then repentance itself constitutes a spiritual work since it is essentially keeping the spirit of God's law in our mind. So think about that, because we understand that when we obey these commandments, it's not the physical actions that are determinate. They, they follow from our attitudes and our thoughts. So we always speak of keeping God's law in the spirit. Well, what do we mean by that? Keeping God's law in the spirit doesn't just mean following all the aspects of it. Keeping God's law in the spirit means that with your mind, you are desiring and wanting to obey God. And you are following all the things that God says about these things. And then that translates into acts of righteousness. But the actual righteousness is not, it doesn't start with the acts. It starts in the mind. So when you purpose to obey and you're committed to obey, you are obeying. That's what I'm trying to get at. That itself is a spiritual work. Repentance is a spiritual work. You're working in the spirit, in your mind, you're obeying God, even though it's not actually translated yet into Acts. But they will, that will naturally translate into Acts. And that's why Paul says, if we look at the previous chapter here, uh, chapter 2 and verse 13, he makes very clear, he says, For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. So how is that? I mean, you put these two things together, does it make sense? It says we are justified apart from the deeds of the law, but here it says the doers of the law will be justified. Well, that's because we are justified, made right with God, aligned with him, accounted righteous, when we commit to obeying him out of trust and faith. And then that translates into these actions. And if there is no translating into actions, it means we're not really uh, believe in God in, in our minds and trusting and living in obedience. And so that's why only the doers of the law will be justified. Those who actually are so committed in their minds that it actually translates into the actual works that we do. Still, it must be understood that no amount of law keeping will remove the penalty for prior law breaking. We see that in chapter 3 and verse 20. It says, therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. The, the, that won't do it. You can't have it only by that. Only faith in Jesus Christ and his sacrifice can do that. Can, by that, we can receive the forgiveness of past sins. And moreover, even when converted, we still sin and continually need forgiveness through faith. We read that in 1 John 1, 8-9. 1 John 1, 8 through 9, just as a reference, where it says that if, if we say we have no sin, we're liars. The truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he's, he's faithful and just to for, forgive us our sins. And we go forward. So we cannot earn our salvation. Many accuse us of teaching that. We don't. We cannot earn our salvation. Paul writes, and uh, look here at, at Romans 3 and verse 27. He says, where is boasting then? Like, you know, what can we say? Oh, this is something great about me. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. You know, it's not, not anything we do. By what law of works? No, but by the law of faith. Now, this is really interesting. Um, Paul calls the requirement of belief a law. So you're required to believe as a law of God. And again, remember, faith is a weightier matter of what? A weightier matter of the law. We were told that already in, in uh, Matthew 23. So faith is a weightier matter of the law. In Hebrews, by the way, the book of Hebrews, I'll just reference this. This is in Hebrews 3, 18 through 19. Disobedience is equated with disbelief. It says there, it's talking about the Israelites, that so they could not go into the promised land. They could not inherit that. It says, because they didn't believe, but then it says, so we see that they couldn't, uh, well, it says, because they didn't obey, and it says, so we see they couldn't enter because of unbelief. <laughs> it's both. 
because it's the same. Unbelief translates into disobedience, where true belief and faith translates into actual obedience. But what I want to stress here is that people who have a problem with the law, well, we, shouldn't, we don't need to keep the law, <laughs> they also have a problem with faith. In fact, what does Paul say? The law of faith it is a law to have faith. It is, it, you must obey God in having faith. And if you don't, then you are condemned. So we have to have faith. I want to move on to establishing the law. Establishing the law. And we see that here too. Now, by no stretch of the imagination does faith do away with God's law, as many people argue. And that wouldn't make any sense at all. Paul writes, and we see this in Romans 3.31. Romans 3.31, he asked the question. I mean, he already saw it coming. And people were going to argue back about what he was saying. Do we then make void the law through faith? Do we make void the law through faith? Okay, so uh, by faith, you know, or he's, he's saying by the deeds of the law, nobody's justified. And he, he's making that big point. So does that mean that um, we make void the law through faith? We don't need the law. Certainly not, he says. On the contrary, we establish the law. We establish the law. Establish here is from the Greek word we saw earlier, histemi, to stand up. We stand up the law. But how does faith enable the law to stand? Or to, it puts it on a firmer footing? Well, there's a couple ways. Um, one that you see is where Paul said back in verse 20 of Hebrews 3, it, for the reason that nobody's justified by the deeds of the law is it says, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So the law tells us what sin is. So we come to God to be forgiven of sin, and if faith makes void the law, then there, there is no law to be forgive, forgiven of breaking. So the very fact of needing faith to receive forgiveness shows you the validity of the law. That's one level, but that's, that's only a starting point. It goes far beyond that it also has to move into actually obeying that law. And this goes into what we saw just a minute ago about how, how does belief translate to obedience? Well, take a moment and think about the following question. If you absolutely and totally believed that everything, every, that you believed everything God has said in his word is true, would you really continue to break the law? Now, I don't mean that, yeah, I know God's law is true, but I mean it at every moment, <laughs> you absolutely believe it. Here's an analogy. I've given this before. It, it, let's say you pick up a bottle that you absolutely know is filled with deadly poison that is going to cause great pain when you take that. Now, unless you're trying to commit suicide and you don't mind being in agony for a while, how likely would you be to take a drink? Knowing without question that you are going to die in, pains, in pain over the next several minutes or, or longer. Now, just as painful death is the result of drinking certain poisons, so also are suffering and misery the results of sin. But there's another path that we can take. God tells us his way of life will bring the greatest happiness. The most wonderful existence possible. We, we live without regrets. We just have a joyous life. We're, we, there's, there's a certain denial of immediate gratification, but it's going to be better. Every moment is better if we obey God. When we're in a mindset of absolutely believing what God says, we adhere to his way, fearing to drink the deadly poison. We obey we continue on the course. We continue to rely on God. Now, at other times, we may, we may know God's way is right. Well, we know that. But we sometimes forget how absolutely real God is and that he is actually right here with us. God lives in us, right? God and Christ are here, and they, their presence is always a, a, with us. And they are here with us today. So, consequently, because we forget that, we don't take God's warning seriously. 
We may think instant fleshly gratification will make us feel better. And so we give in to temptation. You know, we, we think, ah, oh, I can say this bad thing against this person here. And, uh, you know, w- would, you do, would you say that if, uh, if you're standing right next to Jesus? <laughs> Maybe to this other person? Well, guess what? You are. <laughs> That's the key. You've got to remember that. Jesus is right there, always. And we don't always remember that. And so a major culprit here is disbelief. If we really and truly believe God, being utterly convinced that He in the Spirit is always right here with us, we would know better, and we would act accordingly. Christ said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That is John 8, 32. The truth will set you free. Knowing the truth, you will know the truth. That's going to set you free. And of course, in this sense, when we talk about knowing the truth, it's really a matter of faith. Because how do you know it's true? Well, you you trust, you believe what God has said. That, by the way, I'll just reference 2 Thessalonians 2.13. is an interesting wording there. It mentions belief in the truth, that we need to have belief in the truth, but actually the word in is really a possessive. It really means belief of the truth. So we have a belief that is of the truth. In, in having the truth explained to us, we develop a trust in it. We come to accept it. We come to believe it. And that is how we know it. We know it because God has told us and we believe it. And so we know. We know it with all of our being, we must come to know it that way. That is actually what faith is, even though it's without necessarily the seeing proof. We, we know it in our hearts because our, and our minds because we are changed to accept it. But for carnal human beings, such absolute faith lies out of reach. The natural human mind is always bombarded by Satan's negative broadcast. You know, we read in Ephesians 2, 2, the prince of the power of the air. He's always working. And we are also humanly subject to our own very myopic, short-sighted interpretation of reality. The human mind of itself simply cannot gain proper perspective. And that's in large part why the carnal mind cannot submit to God's law. It says that in Romans 8, 7. Cannot. It is constantly under assault from the enemies of faith. And I will list these and give the references for them, but what I want to mention is these are places where Jesus said you know, to his disciples, like, why did you fear, O you of, of little faith? O you of little faith. That's what he says in, in all these four instances. And the four instances cover worry and fear and doubt and human reason. Why do you reason among yourselves? O you of little faith. These references are Matthew 6, 25 through 30, for worry. Fear in Matthew 8, 26. Doubt in Matthew 14, 31. And human reason in 16, 8 of Matthew. And the, the, we all contend with these things, you know, humanly speaking. As human beings, our own faith in God and Christ is not enough. Why don't you look over at Mark chapter 9, you turn over there. We see an episode here. Gives us insight into this, and it tells us the perspective and attitude that we need to have as well. Yeah, there was a man who wanted Jesus to heal his demon-possessed son. And in Matthew 9. 23, Jesus said to him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Okay, that's, that's wonderful. And we know that, you know, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. You need to have that trust. You need to have that. And he, and he did have a certain trust because he's asking for the healing from, through Jesus. But look at verse 24. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. 
This is exactly what we must ask God on a continual basis. Humanly, there is always going to be some doubt, along with the other enemies of faith. So what does God do? Well, consider that God himself battles none of the enemies of faith. He certainly has no doubts about his own existence or what he is capable of doing. Furthermore, from his omniscient perspective, he knows absolutely the joys of his own way and the consequences of sin. Even as a human being, Jesus retained this amazing perspective. Thus, his faith was absolute. And incredibly, God has made it possible for us to have that very same faith. But how? Is it this time of year that we reflect on the most precious gift that God has given to us, the Holy Spirit? Following true repentance and having faith in Jesus Christ, who died for us as our personal Savior, and being baptized for the forgiveness of sins, we receive the Holy Spirit, as we're told in Acts 2.38. It's called in 2 Timothy 1.7, a spirit not of fear, but of power. A spirit of power. Part of the fruit that it bears in our lives, if you look at the listing of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 through 23, is faith. It bears faith as part of that, that fruit. Indeed, it is the very faith of Jesus Christ who now lives in us through the Spirit. And I'll just reference Galatians 2, 20 in the King James Version. I am crucified with Christ, yet not I, but Christ lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So faith is not just something that we draw on every now and again. We are actually to live by faith. Notice that, you know, the life I live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. That is to be our life. In fact, it is Christ's faith that we must live by. And that translates into obedience. I'd like you to look over here at Romans chapter 1 and verse 17. And actually, I'm going to read this from uh, I think in the let me, see, let me get to that first. Romans 1. I passed it. I was there and just went by. Verse 17. It says, For the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Now, what is the righteousness of God? That is, again, all your commandments are righteousness. So we're talking about God's way of life, His law, being lined up with God, is revealed from faith to faith. Now, what is that talking about? We'll talk about it a little bit more here in a second, but the idea is that you go from a certain level of faith and exercise obedience, and you go to increasing faith. Go to greater faith. You go greater and greater, ever-increasing faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. So it's a matter of exercising faith, but as we do, it becomes our whole life so that we live by faith. Now, besides what we saw earlier about obeying based on absolute trust in God's word, there is still more to the relationship between faith and law-keeping. When we purpose to obey God, something that is humanly impossible to accomplish on our own, we step out in faith, knowing that we're not flying solo. We know that to the degree that we yield to Christ living in us through His Spirit, He keeps the law in and through us not for us, he keeps it through us. As he's called in Hebrews 12, verse 2, he is called the author and finisher of our faith. He is the author and finisher of our faith because he is creating that faith within us. And he is, he is giving us of his own faith to, to make it our faith, to build that within us. We can compare this in a way, and I... I like this analogy, I've used it before, but I think about leaping across a thousand foot chasm that has to be 
crossed. Now, you think, humanly speaking, it's impossible. Just as it is impossible, humanly, to keep God's law in its full spirit and intent on our own. The carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. It is impossible on our own to obey the law in its full spirit and intent in a lasting way. Nevertheless, it can be done. There's this thousand foot chasm. It can be done. For there is a way to leap across. It is the way of faith. If we believe, and why do we believe? Because God's told us that's what we got to do. <laughs> so we believe we are going to do it. And if we believe, then Jesus Christ will leap the chasm through us. As Paul says in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But it's not as if we just sit back with nothing to do. You know, for that belief has to be accompanied by action on our part. We can't just wait for Christ to carry us. That simply is not going to happen. He won't do it all for us. We must jump too, with all of our might, taking a leap of faith. Maybe get the, the preferably you've got to get the running start. You've got to do everything you can to jump that chasm, and you've got to make it, and you've got to leap off of there. And then, through the power of the Holy Spirit, like some unseen rocket pack strapped to our back, Jesus will exercise his omnipotent will. And in partnership with Christ, we will make it across. Turn to Colossians 1.29. Paul tells us this is how it has to be. In Colossians, he was talking about his own work, but we can put ourselves in here too. Colossians 1, verse 29, Paul says, to this end that you know, we're called to do, I also labor, I labor, I'm working, I'm doing very hard, striving, but not by himself. Notice what he says, striving according, and it's striving, by the way. What is striving? Striving means struggling, really pushing. It doesn't mean that you're just kind of coasting along. You are really agonizing, struggling, striving. According, notice this, to his working, which works in me mightily. That's the key. I labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. Indeed, we must work, but only through faith. Trusting him or our work is in vain. We'll get nowhere. If we jump on our own, we won't make it across. We have to know <coughs> that when we jump, he's going to be there to help us. The prophet Isaiah explained, and I'll just reference Isaiah 64, 6. All our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. Our righteousnesses means our attempts to keep God's law on our own. All our righteousnesses, all our own attempts to obey or for obedience, Filthy rags. And that was a big part of ancient Israel's problem. Look back over here at Romans chapter 10. What Paul explained about this in Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, we'll look at verses 2 through 3. He was talking about his own countrymen, the Israelites. As he mentions in verse 1, verse 2, he starts out, For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, verse 3, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and what again is righteousness? Righteousness is being lined up with God, being obedient to his will, his way of life, following his commandments. Being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Now that doesn't just mean that they were trying to follow their own laws instead of God's laws. Of course, there was a problem with that that we've seen at other times. 
building up their own traditions instead of God's commandments. But there was a broad knowledge also of God's commandments. But the problem was there was an attempt to obey these commandments by fencing in the law and doing all these meticulous observances and all this that wasn't really obeying the commandments in the spirit. And even if they got it in their head, what they were supposed to do, it wouldn't have come from their hearts because they were not submitted, as it says, to the righteousness of God. Notice, what does that mean? The righteousness of God. That is God's righteousness, His own lawful obedience. God observes His own way of life. Christ keeps the law of God. He keeps it in us. That was their problem. They were trying to do this on their own. They did not have God. They were not submitting to God living His way through them. They, didn't, they were incapable of that. That was their enormous problem. It is by faith that we must yield to Jesus Christ living in us, trusting in Him to establish within us God's righteousness, the full spirit and intent of His commandments. And this is only possible by the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit. So here then is how faith establishes the law. It is through faith that we receive and use the power of the Holy Spirit through which Jesus lives in us to obey God. Then, like Paul, each of us can say that we are found in Christ. I'd like you to look at Philippians 3.9. I'm going to read this from the King James. Because again, it should be the faith of Christ here that I'm going to read this from. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 9. As Paul says, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, that is, trying to earn salvation through self-generated effort, but that which is through the faith of Christ, it should say, that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. It is the alignment with God's way that comes from God through faith. The obedience in the mind, the alignment that translates into active, working out, living obedience uh, that comes through Christ and His faith that then, tra that then is what we must live by. That's how, we, that's how it works. Righteousness, remember, is walking in God's commandments. That's how we do it. So now I want to talk about walking with God. Walking with God. So brethren, this is living faith. Faith accompanied by righteous works. Turn to James 2. James chapter 2. And we look at verse, uh, verses 20 through 22. James says, but do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? And we think, well, wait a minute. Paul used Abraham as an example and said that Abraham was justified before his works, which is true. But now we're saying, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar. Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. There's a synergism between faith in God and his way of life and our commitment to doing godly works. So what is a synergism? Synergism is that principle where the, uh, the sum effect is greater than the parts. When you add these two things together, you think, well, it's not, what, what results is not just this plus this. It's something greater than that. That's a, a, synergis, a synergy. Every time, how does it work? Every time that we take that leap of faith to obey God and are successful through Christ living in us, 
the more faith we will have to obey in the future. Nothing succeeds like success. Uh, that's a, a great expression, and it's very true. When you make it, you know you can make it, and so you keep going. You know, failure is a real uh, crippling thing because then you don't believe you can do it. But if you're succeeding, you trust more that you can go further. And that's, that's what we're talking about here. But even if we do fail, we can still get back up and keep trying until we're making it, and then we can keep going. So every time we, we succeed, we're going to keep going forward. The next verse, I want us to notice this, in James 2. And this is um, really remarkable if you think about it in what we were talking about earlier. Remember where it said that Abraham, this is, uh, let's read verse uh, 23. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. But notice, I want to key in on this. Verse 22 said, Faith was working together with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. And so James says, And so it could be the scripture was fulfilled. This is how it was fulfilled. Because remember, when it says he believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, it was before his works. But then when he did works, when he did active works and he was willing to offer Isaac on the altar, it was these works of obedience and doing what God says. That is how God's statement of accounting him righteous was fulfilled. It was fulfilled by him actually doing righteousness in his life. And because the more he obeyed God, the more he was able to trust and believe and the more he was able to obey. The entire Christian life is an exercise in faith. And the more that we grow in faith, the more faithful or trustworthy we become. Some Bible versions render the weightier matters of the law as justice, mercy, and faithfulness. And that's true too, because in a way it doesn't really matter how we say that, since faithfulness to God is developed through having faith. You know, the, the faith of Jesus Christ growing ever stronger within us. Indeed, the more confidence that we have in God, the more He can depend on us to remain true to Him. And the more trustworthy we will be in general. So the more trusting we are of God, the more trustworthy we become. The more He can depend on us. So we... We need to think about this in, in personal evaluation. You know, how are we doing in this weightier matter of the law? Are we letting Christ build his faith within us? Or do we too often rely on our own solutions, contrary to God's laws? You know, we need to just obey God. There are times when we go, I don't know what, what I should do here. I mean, there might be some out there watching this. Maybe you think, well, I'm short on money. I'll just, I'll stop tithing. I'll dip into the tithes. That is, you know, you're not believing God when you do that. He says he's going to bless you if you obey him first. Put God first, do what he says, all the other things are taken care of. That's what it says in, uh, in, Jesus said in Matthew 6, you know, he said, if we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all our needs will end up being taken care of. And that doesn't mean you don't do wise things and prudent things and try to prepare and, and do what you can. But we always have to do it within the laws of God and work very strongly to obey God, keeping the Sabbath. You know, sometimes people might think they should have to go into work and work on the Sabbath. I mean, there might be an emergency where we'd need to do that, but as a regular practice, um, you know, if you're coming into the, the church, you need to uh, not do that. Trust God, he'll work it out. And I'm saying that to new people, but uh, a lot of us people have been in the church for a long time. They make other compromises, things that we do that we think are, are fine. We need to just trust God to work it out. As long as we are following what he says, he will take care of us. Maybe we, we won't approach our brother who's offended us because we want to avoid some problem. But God says we need to do that. There's things we need to do. Uh, we need to trust him to work it out. 
Do we continually forgive our brother who, though repentant, repeatedly sins against us, remembering that mercy is also a weightier, more important, more important part of God's law? Humanly, continually forgiving someone might, seem, might, might not seem like a very smart thing to do. Yet Christ told his apostles this, and I want you to look at this, because and you'll see the connection here in just a minute. Luke 17, Luke 17, and uh, here in verse 3, Jesus said, Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Okay, to which his stunned apostles replied in the next verse, the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. How do we do that? How do we do that? Well, that is the answer right there. Increase our faith. That is something that we should all be asking. Remember that our whole life is to be one of faith. So in everything, we must always do the right thing and let the chips fall where they may, confident that God will preserve us. And as he says in Romans 8, 28, he will make all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. God's going to work it out. The biblical story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel 3, you should read that uh, with that in mind. It drives home this lesson in a powerful way. You know, those guys said, well, we trust God to deliver us, but even if he doesn't, right now, that is, we're not going to do what you're saying. <laughs> we're going to obey God, and he's going to take care of us, ultimately. And of course, God took care of them then, but there's other people who died for the faith. But they'll be in a better resurrection. That day is coming. As we go through the process of growing in Christ's faith and thereby his character, we come to realize the full reality of God. We come to an acute awareness of our own nothingness without him. That produces a profound humility and in turn even greater submission to his divine will. Look at James 4. And I'll have us turn to one more verse after this and we'll wrap it up. But look at James 4. And uh, this is in verses um, 6 through 10. Sorry, I was there. And there we are. 6 through 10. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud. But gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. And we'll skip down to verse 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. So if we are humble before God, we, what is that really talking about? It's talking about living your life knowing that you don't have what it takes, but God does. And that's why you need him all the time. You need him for everything. And if you live your life that way, that means you're humble before him. You're not all boastful and self-confident. You're confident in God. You're trusting in him. You live by faith, not in yourself, but in the living God. And that doesn't mean that you discount yourself entirely in the sense that, oh, uh, you know, I can mistreat myself. It doesn't mean that. It means that you trust God's plan for you and for everybody else. Uh, you don't exalt yourself. You humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. Let Him do that for you, and He will. And that takes us to the final verse here, which is in Micah 6. You turn over there. Micah 6. And uh, verse 8. It's an important verse. When Jesus mentioned the weightier matters of the law to the Pharisees, he was essentially paralleling what he had inspired the prophet Micah to write. 
hundreds of years before, here in Micah 6, verse 8. And it says here, He has shown you, O man, what is good. That is, what is the way of God in that sense? And what does the Lord require of you? That's a law. This is the law of God in that sense. What does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So Jesus said the weightier matters of the law are justice and mercy and faith. And we see something here. There's a correspondence. Doing justly goes right along with this, uh, of justice or righteous judgment. To love mercy. Jesus said the weightier matters of the law is mercy is one of those. That's right here. The love of mercy or loving kindness becomes simply mercy as Jesus gave it. And Jesus said faith which corresponds to what? Walk humbly with your God. Faith is walking humbly with God. This is real living faith. Deep humility and reverence must be our attitude as we walk hand in hand with our loving Father and Creator. Humble and trusting as a little child, and in this way the just live by faith. So what does God require of you? of us all, that we wholeheartedly love and obey him, giving special attention to the weightier matters of the law, judgment and mercy and faith and the love of God. And as we go through our Christian lives then, let us all devote more time to these vital areas in prayer, study, and meditation. And more important still, let us live by them and grow to become more and more like our Savior, Jesus Christ. May you all have a richly rewarding Feast of Pentecost coming up.